and welcome to the VPod Network and Inside the Chicago Outfit. I'm James Enzo Forney, the show co-creator, and I'm here with my esteemed mobologists and friends. Camille Robinson, contributing writer. Joey Seifert, co-creator. Paul Whitcomb, contributing writer on Inside the Chicago Outfit. Today, we're very excited about episode eight. We're going to be talking about Milwaukee Phil Felix Aldericio, famous Don of the Chicago Outfit. But before we get to that, I'd like to introduce our special guest, Nick Seifert, all the way here from Florida. Hey, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And we're very excited because we're creating a docu-series about the life story of Joe and Nick Seifert, and also based on the book about their lives called Deadly Associates, which will be coming out uh, on a major cable network. And also, Cam and Paul are going to appear in the docu-series as well. So it's a very exciting time for us here. Uh, at, on the VPod network as we start to explore these stories. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's, with that, let's get started on uh, who Felix Aldericio is. Cam, take me back. When did, when did Aldericio come into the public consciousness and how do we know about him? It came up as, as, as in the street gangs in, in Chicago. He was a tough guy. Like, like Paul has said, he was, he was born in New York, but they immigrated to Chicago. And he was a tough kid. And there's not as much known about a lot of these guys early on in their career. It's, that's why a lot of times you want to jump forward. The FBI wasn't involved. The police were corrupt. There weren't a lot of records kept. So you fast forward to when they're about midway through their career in the early 50s or so. So by the early 50s, he was well known around the country. Uh, there's an, There's a... To put it in context of, of popular culture, the movie Casino, we see the scene where uh, Joe Pesci is tightening the, the vice around the, the, the character's eyeball that pops out of his head. The information One gleaned- One of my favorite scenes, by the way. Uh, yeah, it's a classic. The information gleaned from that conversation was later passed on to Milwaukee Phil. Uh, Milwaukee Phil and another well-known uh, Chicago uh, mobster, uh, Chucky Nicoletti, Chucky the typewriter Nicoletti, also for his typing speed, were found in a car parked on the side of the road. The police pulled up, wondering what they were doing, and oh, nothing, we're just waiting for a friend. They pull him out, they frisk him, they go through. The vehicle has hidden compartments for weapons, which had weapons in there. They had a push button that would flip the license plate over to disguise it. Another button you'd push would turn off all the lights in the car. The engine was souped up to uh, much higher horsepower. It was bored out and uh, was, was running at higher compression. So it was basically- This is what they call a, a work car. Exactly. This was, this was one of the earliest known souped up hyper work cars. Uh, I think, I don't know if it had the missiles or the, I, it may have had a smoke screen really that, that you push. I think that they, they did have a button where you would release oil onto the engine block and, and blow uh, a smoke of oil behind it. The police, wondered what they were doing there. It turns out that based on that information, they were looking for, uh, it was Miraglia was the second man, correct? So the second man who had been involved in a shooting on outfit, ter uh, outfit property of uh, friends with the outfit. And uh, the police confiscated Milwaukee Phil's car and later used it to uh, stalk outfit uh, members. They used the outfit's own car against them. But that, that story is where Milwaukee Phil really came into the public conscience. These two men sitting in the car, it was obvious they were there for some reason. The car was full of weapons. And then clearly within 24 hours, the man disappeared anyway, never to be heard from again. It was called the M&M murders. But it, it was just that so- That was a famous case, right? Yes. The M&M murders. Yes. And who was, uh, was anybody ever prosecuted or indicted for that? I. I think years later they tried to bring something against Spilatro, but it never panned out. Right, Paul? No. Yeah, I, Frank Collada, years later, had the information on it. There were two brothers, the Scalvo brothers, and they got into a fight, and later on, uh, these two, Miraglia and Mirabelli, uh, sh shot it out, killed these two brothers on outfit, basically in the outfit's backyard. The Scalvo brothers were tight with Anthony Accardo, and as a form of retribution for a killing people in literally the outfit's backyard. You don't want that done in your neighborhood. And for killing members friendly, uh, and Milwaukee Phil was, he was the bullet that they aimed at this problem. And being found so obviously in a car right before murder, parked right outside a guy's house, car loaded up full of weapons, souped up engine. I mean, he was literally, it, it, it's, interrupting a hitman right in the middle of his job. And from that point forward, Milwaukee Phil became known as the Chicago enforcer, bar none. 
definitely. And he, he earned his nickname, right? How, how did he come up with that nickname? Well, he's a, a... It's got two parts. It's got a regional part, and it's got an action verb part. So break it down for us. <laughs> well, Milwaukee Phil has a real pedigree. He wasn't just some street tough that later started killing people. Yeah. He used to hang around the Lexington Hotel when he was a kid. He would try and pick up jobs, sending messages back and forth for Al Capone. And for the viewers, the Lexington Hotel was a mob-controlled hotel where Capone hanged out on, yes, on Michigan was. Avenue. South Michigan Avenue, right in the center of the city, uh, Capone headquarters. So he hung out there, and he didn't really catch on like Sam Giancana did, like Tony Accardo did, but he had a, a maternal uncle by the name of Cockeyed Louis Frado. Yeah. And talk about good nicknames. You can imagine where that one came from. Uh, he had a, a brother named One Eye, One Eared Louis Fratto. There were some genetic problems uh, there. I and, guess. Uh, yeah. From Appalachia? <laughs> yeah. So Louis Fratto gets Milwaukee Phil hooked up with the outfit. Louis goes on to run the Iowa mob. Believe it or not, there the was one, such yeah. a thing. And he lives in Des Moines for the rest of his life. But Milwaukee Phil then becomes a member of the outfit, starts working for Jake Guzik collecting payouts and passing them off to judges, police officers, and, and clerks, and things like that. He branches out. He becomes a very successful member of the outfit. He branches out and starts going to Milwaukee, where he establishes his own businesses, which is very interesting because Milwaukee had its own boss, Frank Balistrieri, who was the boss of that subset of the Chicago family in Milwaukee. And he was an important guy, right? Didn't he, he? Was, he was invited right. later, and you know, decades later, right? He, he became known to the public, you know, from, from Milwaukee. So this was a viable, active part of the mob. And yeah, and even prior to that, there was the Aliotto family and the, I wonder it was the Guardabeni family. So there was a, a sizable Italian presence before Balistrieri. So as, as Paul said, I mean, there was, it was established prior to Milwaukee film. Going so this there. is where the Milwaukee part comes in? It's where the Milwaukee part comes in. Though his friends in the mob didn't call him Milwaukee Phil, they called him Phil or Philly. Like a lot of these colorful nicknames, you would never think of saying that to their face. Right. Yes. You talk about some of his friends. Don't forget he came out of, which we touched base on before, the 42s, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. With some other up-and-comers. Be sure to Chucky Nicoletti, Fiore, Buccieri, mm -hmm. Sam Giancana, though he was a later generation than Sam Giancana, Sam, yeah, Sam Battaglia. Yeah. Uh, he, he became a part of a, tri a trio of hitters, Sam Battaglia, Milwaukee Phil, and Marshall Cofano. Mm -hmm. They worked together through the 30s until Milwaukee Phil got hooked up with Jake Guzik. Yeah, and Phil would have been a little bit younger, but yeah, yeah, that was... So he had, he had a pretty, pretty long career. Uh, by the time that you guys got to know him, and he uh, started to approach your dad and start to run businesses. How old would we have been, Alderisio? How old was that? He roughly. Was, roughly, he was probably like in his late 50s, early 60s, right in that time when I saw him at International Fiberglass, um, which was probably the first time, one of the first times I met him. And then uh, obviously then the wedding and everything else, you know. And, and, and then, you know, a couple of barbecues. We went to his house and stuff, and, and you know they were making steaks and mushrooms, and then we had a couple of barbecues there. And uh, was he a pretty good cook, Calderisco? Man, let me tell you, he could make some uh, mushrooms, fried mushrooms on the grill that were just outrageous. They were outrageous, uh, so good that uh, I had a lot of them and uh, <laughs> made a pig of myself. And then the second time we went there. Uh, there, there were no mushrooms, and I got. I was like, "Where are the mushrooms?" It was kind of. I thought that that was like, you know, almost like an insignia. And uh, I said to him, "I says, uh, hey, Uncle Phil, where, where, where are all the mushrooms?" And he said, "Well, I didn't get any mushrooms." I said, "Oh man, I thought those mushrooms were great." He looked at the guy in back of us, and he said, and he didn't even say a word. He just, and the guy went to the store and got some mushrooms, and bang, he came back probably 20 minutes later, and they were cooking mushrooms again. And it was fantastic. Wow. He used to use this big skillet, and he'd put it on the grill, and that's how he would make the mushrooms. And, and they were unbelievable. <laughs> okay, so he's a man of many talents, Al yeah. He's got cuisine, yeah. he's yeah. got uh, being able to fill your, your gut with lead. Yeah. Uh, he's a little he's, older, he'd have his own cookbook. 
That's right. <laughs> right. He had his own show. Yeah. The new meaning to the term Philly. Iron Chef. Um, what? Uh, the lead chef. The lead chef. The lead, the lead chef. chef. Yeah. I think we just created it. Yeah. Yeah. Got another show. Um, so I know I jumped ahead. Um, Paul, did you want to take that anywhere after? So he gets his nickname. Before uh, the 1960s, when Daniel Seifert, the, uh, Joe and Nick's dad, would have met him, what would his rise have been like in the outfit? What, what, what occurred for him in, say, the 50s and 60s, early 60s? Well, in that, in that time period, like Camilla said, he is without a doubt the most feared hitter in the Chicago outfit. And that's saying a lot. You're competing with Sam Battaglia, Marshall Cafano, Chucky Nicoletti, uh, just a whole list of really scary people. But Milwaukee Phil is considered the most vicious and brutal of all the torpedoes in the Chicago outfit for the 50s and the 60s. So he had been active through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And throughout all this time, violence is his signature. That's, that's his, uh, his currency. He's a, that's how he gets through what everything. It, what it speaks to, like Paul said, is, is, is you know, I, I, the, the, the Guzik thing and, and, and what a later story will show with, with uh, Las Vegas. You know, Phil was fine with the violence. He was fine with the street stuff. And, and he was honestly known throughout the country uh, as, a, as a couple stories will show that, that he, just for being tough and able to get things done. But there are also stories of him going over the books of different businesses and, and being able to compare number sheets. So it wasn't as though he was, he was had a, a single, singular purpose and, you know, we just need somebody's knuckles, you know, somebody's kneecaps broken, so send Phil. I mean, Phil was an across the board. He was the, that sort of old school, <laughs> multi-talented gangster that she used to hear about. Uh, he could really do it all. And, um, you know, and then he could cook mushrooms with the kids. Right. You know? right. So, yeah, multi-talented. And that's kind of funny, too, because what they would do is get, you know, uh, legitimate businesses and turn them into, you know, mob-controlled businesses. That right. was one of the things that Aldericio did, which, you know, turns out that one of the businesses that was, you know, involved in that was international fiberglass. So that was one of the lessons, right, that, that the post Capone mob bosses learned, right? That they couldn't leave a trail that the IRS could easily come after, right? So they had to find other ways to launder money and legitimate businesses gave them that tool to do that. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Mm -hmm. It's a fair assessment and as the decades rolled on, you saw more and more of purchases of strip malls and office buildings and car dealerships, real estate ventures, travel agencies, uh, all that mob money went into these businesses, which not only could launder illegal funds, but produce legitimate ones. Right. Weren't they usually certain types of businesses, though? Like certain types are better and easier to launder through than others? Sure, but there was also a lot of commercial real estate. Uh, Paul Rico owned a huge bank building in Texas. Um, Tony Accardo owned malls and, and things that were just, just enormous mm -hmm. and worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Like Lombardo had golf courses. Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. You look at something like, like international fiberglass, and if you're trying to launder money from a skim, and you go into a business that, that has, you know, huge, uh, 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 you know, you're buying a lot of material, mm -hmm. and you have you know, huge record sheets from, from companies, you're making large purchases here, they're making large purchases here, and if you own three or four of the companies and, and you have the balance sheets from this business and you're making purchases here and purchases here, just like you said, Joe. I mean, that's, I think that's, a key, that's, that's key to hiding money when you've got several, several companies that you're passing money around to. I mean, y'all know all about that. Yeah. With, I mean, through your, through your, your father's business. It yeah. shows how adaptive yeah. you know, the mob was and is. There was an article uh, about two years ago about La Cosa Nostra in Italy getting into solar energy. So mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll go into AI next. Um, but in any case, let's drop back to the 1960s and um, talk about Al Dorisio is getting more involved in businesses, trying to figure out how to, how to move the, the funds in, in, from the Central States Union, right? That's, right. What, that's one of his primary functions with Lombardo, with Weiner and Dorfman. So there's right. a, a, a whole group together conspiring to move funds illegal funds, if you will, or fraudulent loans through other businesses. Yeah. So can you give us a little explanation he, about that? He had, he, he had fundamental ties to, to Las Vegas, and we know that Caifano was out there, and Caifano and, and Aldericio were very tight. If you look at a lot of, lot of accounts that took place, uh, the Desert Inn was one of them, and right before uh, 
billionaire Howard Hughes bought all the casinos in Las Vegas. He didn't remove the mob. He didn't really, he bought the casinos from the mob front companies, but the mob stayed in the casinos and continued skimming the money. All Howard Hughes owned really was, was the hotels. And so Howard Hughes coming into Las Vegas, there's, a, there's an idea that he cleaned it up for a time. He really didn't do anything except pay the mob money to remain there. Uh, but at the time, Around about the time Howard Hughes came in the mid 60s, Aldericio was already an established presence. He was connected with guys like uh, 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 Meyer Lansky. And Meyer Lansky had a lot of uh, uh, Jewish mobsters under him, guys like Mo Schenker and, and Mo Dallitz. I'm sorry, Mo Schenker's a, a lawyer, but he, was, he had casinos. Mo Dallitz was the man out there. And casinos would pay gangsters to go and collect funds that had been loaned, or if casino owners wanted to, they, they wanted to launder their skimmed funds, then they would see, search out other avenues. So the Desert Inn, uh, the man who owned the Desert Inn was a guy named uh, Rudy Collad, who was partnered up with Meyer Lansky and was also tight with Phil Aldericio. Rudy Collad came up with 65 grand with his partner, Willie the Ice Pick Alderman. And they give it to this lawyer from uh, Denver, a guy named Sunshine, Robert Sunshine. He says, I can invest your money in oil futures. Well, it was, and, and when you make legal investments, you stand to win, you stand to lose, sometimes you lose. And so they lost 65 grand down the tube. So Rudy Collard sends Milwaukee Phil. This is to collect it. And this is in 1964. So Phil would have been but so tied into the Vegas community that this is the, the owner of a casino that calls up Phil and says, you know, can you handle this for me? Which puts him in a position where he's recognized by the entire country. Mm. And he's, this is a guy who's partnered up with, with Meyer Lansky and everybody. So the whole country knows that Phil Aldericio in Chicago is a guy who you go to. Phil Aldericio goes to see this lawyer, Sunshine, and says, you know, you know the money, it, that's it. I'm, I'm here to kill you, you're done. And the guy says, please, please look, I'll show you. I didn't steal the money. Didn't take. So he takes out his books and he shows the investments and he shows where the money went. And, he show, and so Phil sits down, he says, hold on, I'll kill you in a minute. And he sits down and he looks at his books and he goes over his figures. He's probably got his glasses sitting down on his eyes and he's, he's looking and he says, Damn, is there, you lost the money, it's, it's legit. So he says, hold on here. He calls Rudy Collard, who's up in the Catskills at a, at a resort up there. He's, he's, I don't know, he's, he's taking Schwitz. And so he's like, <laughs> calls him up and he gets him out of the sauna. And he says, hey, he, he legitimately lost money. The guy didn't steal it. He's just, he's just dumb. And so he says, we're not going to get a return on this skimmed, stolen money. And so he says, all right, you don't have to kill him, but he's got to pay us back two grand a month. And I want interest. <laughs> Gonna make money off that stolen yeah. money one way or another. So, <laughs> but that was Phil. The whole country recognized that that's who you send. Wow. But can you imagine the minutes when you're sitting there? He's like, let me make a phone call. Wait, you get clicked. Yeah, I yeah. might. I might not have to. Sweating yeah. through the chair. That's quite, <laughs> that's quite an audit. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also, he had the ability to understand what he was looking at. There's some I people you yeah. would send to you know, break bones or, or kill someone who yeah. wouldn't have the first idea what a ledger was about. Exactly. Who wouldn't know it was a, a win or a loss. Exactly. Wow, very interesting. So this is like 64? Yeah, they were, and they were charged in 65. Here's, here's how times changed before the RICO Act. Uh, the lawyer, uh, the casino owner, Claude, did, I want to say two years and $7,500 fine. The uh, Lawyer, uh, Sunshine was disbarred. I, Phil might have done a year or two. Hmm. The FBI was involved in all of this. Was was right after um, right when Robert Kennedy was still sort of going on things. So this would have been sixty three or sixty four. Mm -hmm. They fought it for a while, and I think Phil did a little bit of time. But that was that was all pre Rico. So the, nobody was going to do more than two years, and like I said, a seventy five hundred dollar fine. So he gets out, and now he's going to be looking for some other vehicles, some some other businesses. And lo and behold, we have international fiberglass. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, your father, Daniel Seifert, had, had two partners. Who were the partners and what was the breakdown of the ownership? What do you remember? Well, the breakdown, how it went, it was three guys. <clears throat> Phil Aldericio, Irv Weiner, and then my father, Daniel Seifert. And they came up with, you know, 33 and a third. And that's how they cooked it up, that, you know, it was divided in three ways. And my dad... 
was initially the guy that started working the business. And then that's when the mob started sending other people, you know, there, like Joe Lombardo and, and the guy Ralphie and different things. And then that's when they were all working the company together. And then obviously getting loans from the Teamsters Union and trying to uh, skim the funds from the Teamsters Union into the company and then, you know, sending the, the revenue outside. But working it all together, her dad was the only one actually working, working. Yeah, he was the only were, actual guy. He was actually trying he, to make a successful business. He was trying to make it a successful business and managing Which the business. Did, though, right? It was a successful oh, business. Oh, yeah. yeah. They were very, very successful. Yeah. You know, um, they had a lot of customers, a lot of clients. Uh, they did a lot of prototypes. They did, you know, they did work for uh, Brookfield Zoo and uh, obviously the Museum of Science and Industry. They, they had, you know, a lot of the vacuum forming. Um, machines that they produced and they put in those different uh, uh, museums. And then they also did hulls of boats. They had uh, molds in international that they would, you know, make hulls for, for small boats, you know, like Boston, similar to Boston Whaler, you know, stuff like that. Um, all kinds of different fiberglass work. And then they started to get in slowly into the plastic business, vacuum forming and stuff like Injection that. Injection molding. Injection molding. Yeah. Exactly. So he, it was really a legitimate, you could even say thriving business. Well, they had to, just like Cam said, they had to make it look that way so that it didn't raise any eyebrows, so that they could actually, you know, divert funds to Las Vegas. And, you know, you can't divert funds, you can't get loans from the Teamsters Union and divert funds to Las Vegas with a business that isn't thriving, a business that's bankrupt, you know, now that's going to cause more problems with the IRS than anything because you can't show the money. And they wanted to be able to show the money. Maybe not all the money, obviously, the large sum of loans they would get because it was a few million dollars. And back then, that was a lot of money. So they had to show, you know, that it was a successful business along with, you know, a sister company, Gaylor Products, who was associated with that. And then they... And, and what did they do? They were in, uh, where, were they in Elk Grove or nearby? Or? They, they were close. Yeah, they were near Elk Grove. Um, and, and that was kind of a, a, a similar company. And what they would do is it, uh, change dyes and... Th th Gaylor Products was getting more, was already there, so to speak, in the plastic business. And my father at International was trying to get wean away from the fiberglass to get in more into plastic business. And that's how they could interject the two companies together and being able to, uh, both companies, getting loans and embezzling money from the Teamsters Union and diverting the funds through Las Vegas. And that's how they used Gaylor products, you know, and, and actually Tony Spilatro was a strong influence in Gaylor products as Joe Lombardo became more of a stronger figure in international because by this time, Phil L. Dericio wanted to move on to the next, he had, what he would do is he'd get a company, get it up and running and get it where it managed itself. And then he would move out of the picture and then go to another company and try to do the same thing, which what they were trying to do is legitimize the mob and make it, I think they, what they were doing is looking towards the future and trying to legitimize it to where the IRS and the FBI weren't constantly breathing down their necks for, you know, for money laundering. Mm -hmm. Right. Felix would install a, a capo or a soldier, somebody to look over each organization. Day-to-day -day operations, yeah. And then he would move on. So in, in International Fiberglass's case, it's Joe Lombardo. In Gaylor Products, it's Spilatro. But Spilatro also had another business, right, out at, at Circus Circus, or was that later? That was later. That later. was a little bit later. You're yeah. talking about yeah. the uh, the gift shop? Yeah. Yeah. But um, Al Dorisio, you know, he, he would normally do that. That's how he would set it up. He would back away. But then in my father's case, it became personal. So it wasn't like he just moved on. Uh, El Dericio always kept an interest in my father and took my father under his wing and never, you know, so-called abandoned that business and let it start sink or swim, so to speak. El Dericio always kept in contact with International. It was kind of a baby to him. And of course, he had a great relationship, more of a father-son figure with my father. 
Yeah, that's that's what uh, I remember talking with Joe about that. That yeah. there was a really good relationship between Danny and and Felix. And part of that, what do you, how do you think that relationship came about? Did, did Felix not like his own son? Is that what, the, what went on? There was something with his son, right? Well. His son didn't necessarily want, his son wanted to do his own thing and didn't want anything to do with any kind of organized crime. His son, you know, was a legitimate guy. And so they he did, wasn't falling in line? He no, was he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't working with his, with his father. He didn't want to, he didn't have the same interests. And so he really, um, he came, he started with International. You know, there was a beginning there, but he would slowly try to phase out. And I think that, you know, his father, uh, Phil, Uncle Phil, <laughs> would, um, maybe that was some of the reasons why he would back off a little bit, hoping that his son would continue on with International. Because actually, Felix Aldericio's son and my father had a pretty good relationship as well, you know. Um, and I think my father didn't have a problem working with him, but um, Phil Aldericio's son did, had nothing, he wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted nothing to do with the organized crime era. Um, and well, also a fiberglass, it's horrible. Well, fiberglass, yeah, that was, a, that was a treacherous business to be in. And, you know, I myself experienced it, and I, I, I tell you. <laughs> you used to say you loved it, right? Yeah, right. I'd get within a mile of that place, and I swear to God, I'd start itching. <laughs> you know, I'd start itching right away. I didn't even have to get there yet. Within a mile, I would start all of a sudden scratching and itching. Anybody who's put fiberglass insulation into an attic, oh, or yeah. you know, that stuff yeah. just gets. Just they used to get, get mad get because I, I would. Uh, they'd ask me to go on a lunch run because I had a bicycle there, and I would say, "Okay, I'll, it'll be take a while because I got to walk all the way there, walk all the way back." And they were like looking at me like I'm crazy. Well, your bicycle's right there. Take the bike. And, but my bike was full of fiberglass dust. Mm -hmm. So imagine getting on a bicycle and my ass is itching all the time, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um, <laughs> the uh, fiberglass, though, was a big business in the 60s and 70s, right? You think yeah. about, like, boats. But there's also the Corvettes, first, the Corvettes, first yes. car, right? Boats, yeah. yeah. Cars, and period. also yeah. Harley Davidson was moving in some of their bikes they were moving into, which... The fairing was all fiberglass. They did a prototype there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, American, a lot of American race cars were, whereas the Italians would do, would form aluminum. Americans uh -huh. were using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, heat resistance. So it was, a, right, yeah. it was growing. Yeah. Right. And so you guys got pretty close to Al Yeah. Yeah, he was a, he, he was a, you know, we used to call him Uncle Phil. And he was a, you know, uh, uh, he, he was a, a pretty good guy to our family. You know, we His got, name was in the top three for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so let's go over those again. There's Felix, <laughs> Irwin, Irwin, yeah. and, Joey. and Joe. And Joe. I think I think you got the yeah. lottery on the on the Joe part. That was that was a good call. <laughs> My mom pushed for that one. Did yeah. she? Yeah. It's like you're not a Felix. It's like mm, no. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, by the time by the time too, you know, uh, Joe was born. Um, Phil, uh, Uncle Phil Aldericio, he was starting to have health, a lot of health problems. So, you know, I think my dad was subconsciously, you know. And then obviously, then Joe Lombardo became close to our family as well. And then that's why I think that, you know, Joe Lombardo, you know, and actually Joe Lombardo was, you know, my brother's godfather. And, and Joe Lombardo became closer and closer to our family. So I think that's how the name shifted, you know, to Joey, you know. Instead, that, of, instead of Phil. Right, instead of Phil. Now we know when Uncle Joe used to come around, he's, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. The money to all the kids. Was, yeah, yeah. You was tuck, a, tuck money in your pocket, you know. Go get me a pack of cigarettes. Was Phil like that? Yeah. <laughs> was Phil like that or no? No, 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 no. He, he was, um, he, he wasn't uh, as, uh, as personable, you know. I, I don't know how to explain it. Charismatic. He, yeah, he wasn't as personable, although he was very good to us when we go to his house and do cookouts and stuff like that. And every time that I was, you know, on a summer break or a spring break and- Do you remember I, where he lived when you went to his house? Uh, in Chicago, yeah. He was I don't, in the city. Yeah, he was in the city. His but, house is actually famous, um, it's a famous architectural house. Uh, I, I can't remember like the name Frank right Lloyd now. Wright? No, 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 it's, it's, it's not Frank Lloyd Wright, but it's, it's, got a, it's got a name, I can't think of it offhand. Okay. So that's, 
absolutely useless. Any okay. of those cookouts, do you remember anybody else? We, we won't rely on you for art and architecture. Just stay on the mob and we'll be good with you, Kev. Yeah. You're doing great. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay, so you would go to his house. Um, and did he come to your house? Ever? Do you remember that? No, no, no. And he, um, the only ones that really came to our house was uh, like Joe Lombardo, um, uh, Ralphie, you know, which was a soldier uh, for Joe Lombardo. Um, th- those were the only guys that really came to our house. Mm-hmm. And uh, but, Because yeah. Felix is, is, is up higher, right? Yeah, He's a, but uh, but we, we, what would we call him at that point? Is he an underboss, a boss, a capo? He would have... He would have been the boss. Six, yeah, Giancana was gone in 66, then Battaglia, and then Milwaukee Phil was away for a while, Cerrone was away. So yeah, Al Dericio would have been would have been it. Mm-hmm. So he, he fit in as a boss. He was between, who, who so, he led before Cerrone or after? Cerrone would have been in prison in 72, I think okay. when Louis Bomasino rolled over on him. And was it 72 that Cerrone went away? Yes, it was, but by then, Felix was, was dead, dead. Dead in 71, so, so he yeah. He was boss from 69. Yeah, that's right. 67 to 69, 69 and then yeah. he went to prison. Was, was Felix, uh, like, was he a smoker? Was he not in good shape or just a stressor? No, he wasn't a smoker. I didn't, I didn't see him smoke. Um, he was, you know, to me, I, I thought he was, you know, he was an older guy, obviously, but he looked like he'd be like, you know, he was, he could hold his own. He looked like a strong guy. <laughs> Probably all the steak and mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He could definitely, he wasn't one uh, to debate. It, it was like, there was like a, it's hard, it, it was like an aura around him. When he said something or he said, hey, listen, Go get me this, go get me that. I mean, like the second time we went over there and there were no mushrooms and I made a, a little bit of an episode about that. He didn't even say anything. He just looked at the guy and pointed his, and the guy went and grabbed the mushrooms. And I'm sure that's how it went. For and, a lot and that, of them. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. So your family was close. And uh, when Emma and Daniel got married, uh, as, as would happen in, in a 60s, a lot of people get married in a church, and then there was a, a party at, at the house. In this case, it was your parents' house or your grandparents' house? Our grandparents' house, which was uh, my mom's parents' house. On your mom's Melrose side. Park. So she hosted a reception or a party mm-hmm. after the wedding. Yeah, and like an after party. Yeah. And, but Al Dericio couldn't make it to, the, to that reception. None of the guys showed up for that. No, no actually, that's wrong. Who will shoot up? Uh, uh, Erwin Weiner was at the wedding. Oh, okay. Oh, he was at the chapel. Yes, but I, not at the party. Right, I saw but not Weiner at the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in the right. picture. There's yeah. a picture when your mother and father are walking out, and you can see Weiner in the side. He yeah. he he looked as if he was trying to stand out of the picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was. But he wanted his presence known that yeah. there was support. Yeah, that somebody from the outfit was there. Yeah, to support my dad, and he was you know one of the first guys that. Um, came and, you know, introduced my dad and took my dad to El Dericio. And, you know, he's, he was one of the first contacts that introduced my dad to the Chicago outfit. So El Dericio couldn't be there, but did he, uh, did he have a special present for you guys? Oh, yeah, he did. I remember it being this large cookie jar of a lion. And uh, that, was, that was a big deal back then. You know, that was a, it was a personal gift as well, you know. And uh, yeah, he gave a hundred bucks too. Yeah, which for the audience is like five hundred bucks now yeah, at back, least. Back then, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did the what did the cookie jar look like? Uh, it's a, it was about this big, and it's of a lion, yeah, you know, brown, and the 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 crown of the cookie jar would come off, and then that's where the cookies were. Uh, and and so I remember is, this because... What is cookies? <laughs> yeah, cookies. Yeah. Cookies. But I remember this cookie jar being almost like, you know, sacred. You know, do not knock it over. Do not, you know. Hell, I didn't even want a cookie out of it because I was afraid if I broke it, the repercussions. Because it was an important thing to my father. But so, they wouldn't even put it up high back then. Yeah. It was like low. Yeah, so, lights shining. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's how the lying. Yeah. So that what what year did uh, Emma and Daniel get married? Was that 67? 67, 67? 67. 67. I think it was 67. Yeah. Yeah. So 67. That's 63 years ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. what do you think? You want you want to share the lion? Yeah. Yeah. So you thought 
What an amazing show. We have Nick Seifert as a guest, but now we have Elder Lion. 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay, so first of all, the fact that this lion yeah. exists still in your family, how did, how did that work? How did it happen? Well, Aldericio <clears throat> was a big, large, large, greater than life probably, um, influence to my father. It was almost like they were father and son. My dad thought the world of him, and same with Aldericio, thought a lot of my dad, not only personally, but thinking that my dad could handle the things that were going on with the company embezzling. My dad knew all along what the game plan was and was able to handle you know, any FBI attention or anything like that. So my dad, this so they, this, were, they were onto the FBI was on. Oh, were, the whole time, yeah. Were they, they doing stakeouts outside? Ex yeah, there was surveillance here. all the time. We would come into the factory, you know, in the morning, and there would be two FBI cars out there taking pictures, and then we'd surely leave, you know, and there would still be out there taking pictures, you know. There, there was all. It, it was almost like a fixture that we knew the FBI was going to be out there, you know. Never any local police cars. Mm -hmm. You knew they were feds. Right. So he was a large influence in my dad and my dad's life. So this cookie jar was this very, you know, extraordinary gift from a boss to my dad, who was, you know, not really even an associate, maybe an associate, who knows. But it was a, it was a significant gift, and my dad made sure that nothing happened to it. Well, you guys preserved it. I've seen this lion in multiple photos in multiple locations. Yeah. yeah. Well, through that whole time, you know, after my dad was killed and everything, my mom kept this thing, always. I never knew personally where it came from. I just knew that they got it as a gift. It was always kept, like, pristine. At some point, I don't know, I had to ask her about it, but at some point it was broken. And Oh, yeah, it's got, I see it's got, like, a crack or yeah, something. Yeah, she made sure that it was put back together the best that she could. <laughs> Would have been I the mean, opportunity was, to get like rid of it? Really no, it was, really taken care of. No, yeah, mm -hmm. it was coveted, I guess you call it. Well, I also think she had a lot of sentimental... Way. Uh, value to it yeah. because Aldericio was a stronghold on the Chicago mob. During that time when Aldericio was in prison, um, my dad was starting to have complications with other people involved in the mob. And I won't say, they, I, I think that they actually went to El Dorisio and they said, hey, listen, there's a problem. There's, this is going on. We're having problems with the Teamsters Union, with the embezzlement, and, and Danny, I think, is going to cooperate. El Dorisio said, no, no. And no one touch him. No one touch him. He would not sign off on it. Our car, strangely enough, our cardo El, would listen. And it wasn't until Al Dorisio died that even my father knew I got a problem. They're coming for me now. Um, because you, you, Al Dorisio was looking out. He was a heavyweight. Yeah. yeah, he said, no, you're not touching Danny. Danny won't talk. That's what, exactly what they said. He told them, Danny won't, I don't care what you hear. I don't care any of it. I'm not listening to it. When it comes down to it, Danny won't talk. You're not to touch him. There was also a conversation that you had told me about later in years that Danny had a conversation with. I don't remember who you said it was, but he said that if the old man dies, that's it, I'm done. Auntie sis. Yeah. That happened in the basement of our house. He was talking to his sister. And, uh, you know, his sister, you know, was asking. I was downstairs, heard the conversation because we had a ping pong table downstairs and I'm playing ping pong with some of the other kids, actually. And um, I heard Auntie Sis talking to him, and, and he said, uh, if because she was talking about, you know, when he gets out of prison, you know, everything will be fine. And my dad said, he ain't getting out of prison. He's, he's, he's not doing well. And when something happens, when he goes, they're going to come after me. And that's exact. They couldn't touch him. No matter what the Fed said, informants inside the Federal Bureau of Investigations, what anybody said on the street, they couldn't touch him until Aldericio signed off on it. And there was no way Aldericio believed any of it. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't influenced by FBI informants or anything like that, or people that were in the FBI that would cooperate and say, hey, guess who came into the Bureau today? Danny Seifert. 
he wouldn't sign off on it at all. He didn't believe it. Well, and he, he had earned that respect at this point, right? I mean, he, all everything that he'd done in his career up to this point, yeah. Yeah. they were going to listen. I think that says a lot for Al Dorisio's power at that time, with yeah. all of the people that he's saying no to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, was he, uh, did, what, did he have cancer? Do you know what the cause of his death was? To be honest with you, I do not. I Never. just... I just know that you know he died, and uh, but did he did he die in prison or at home or where? No, he died in prison. Prison, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because time honored tradition. Our family uh, thought, you know, honor. like I said, yeah. my my aunts and uncles said, well, you know, maybe you know everything will be different. Every just hang in there until he gets out. And my mm -hmm. dad, I remember my dad saying distinctly, he ain't getting out. He's they're not. He's not. He's not going to make it that long. When he goes. They're going to be coming after me. But they also went to the funeral. Yeah. Our parents did. Yeah. Because we have the funeral card and oh, yeah. they signed the book and everything. Mm. Yeah. It was, I assume, it was a mob funeral home. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's where you see a picture of uh, um, Tony Ricardo sitting on the mm -hmm. fence and everything. Famous picture. Yeah. Mm. It's uh, Iopa and uh, Iopa. There's not many pictures of the Cardo, certainly it's, from, from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Iopa, Iopa and the Cardo. And yeah, Cardo two of them. There. Yep. They're watching and, the and, curse go by. And, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and, 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 you know, like 25 FBI agents were there as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's why my dad used to always bend the license plates on his car. He'd bend the license plates so nobody could write down his license plate because he knew the feds were going to be there, too. You know, taking place. And he was and already at that time. Yeah. At that time, he was already taking heat mm -hmm. from the FBI. So he was trying. He knew that he knew that no matter what, nothing is going to keep him from that funeral. He was going to that funeral. He had to. He had to make the appearance. You know. And so, what what year did he die then? Approximately. Seventy one, I think it was. Seventy one. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't 1971. long. Yeah. yeah. After after. Uh, after the wedding of your uh, uh, mother and father, and uh, so he had a short period of time, Danny did, where he was protected in a sense by. But he was others. building already, though, at that point. Yeah. He was already starting to yeah. rise up. Wow. So he, this guy, Milwaukee Phil, was quite an impactful figure on the, in the history of, of the outfit. Yeah. I mean, Accardo, of course, which we've talked about, you know, was still a top boss, always would be, but Aldericio was right up there. And, and who slid into place after Al Dorisio died? What was the what was the uh, transition then? Well, the problem was that the mob kept losing its talent. Uh, shortly after Al Dorisio died, Paul Riga died. Ricardo's trying over and over again to get out. There's nobody with the talent except for Gus Alex, who is a Greek. So they install a trumpet of three rulers, Ayupa, Ricardo, and Alex. In in that two year period, you lost the entire brain trust. Like like Paul said, you got Rika, you've got you know Aldricio's gone, you've got uh, Ross Prio, you've got Frank Laporte. You've I mean just boom, the, the whole upper echelon with from from seventy to seventy two is gone. Right. So this is so this is the beginning of the era of. Uh, some transition and, ca and yeah. some chaos and has Ayupa, to get sorted out. Mm -hmm. Ayupa was the last man standing. Yeah. From the old, from the old guys. Yeah. Right. And violent. Iopa was violent. Hey, That's so funny. His name was, was Dubs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would, uh, I, Iopa was, he was, uh, he, he, he would jump to the gun to clip you. He didn't need a whole lot of reasoning or he'd say, get rid of him. Get rid of him. You know. Ayupa was a little bit uh, less of the uh, cognitive uh, abilities of Accardo and Saron, as I understand yeah, it, right? He was a more more the... Rhinoceros um, rationale. Well, you know? well, yeah, and once Aldericio died, I believe it was, you know, Iopa that was next to said, now take Danny out. You know, it had to come from Iopa. And, and, and that, that's why you see that one surveillance, FBI surveillance picture on September 27, 1974, mm -hmm. of Iopa with Big John Ficarada. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, what validated that Iopa had to sign off. Iopa had to give the final word that says, clip him. And that was the end. That was it. Because Joe Lombardo would go to him. And, and obviously, just like I said to you, that these guys, if they went to Iopa about a problem, this, a problem, that, Iopa would have automatically just said, well, get rid of him, get rid of him, clip mm -hmm. him. 
And that's exactly what happened. I'm sure Joe Lombardo went to him and said, hey, listen, we got this problem. And Iopa said, he's got to go. Joe, Nick, you wrote about this in your book, Deadly Associates. You talked a, a lot about what the situation was like then. Um, it had to be a, a very high pressure situation with the feds breathing down your father's neck on the one hand and him being willing to testify in, in obviously a case that was fundamental. But he was never able to do that because the mob took him out. Right. Uh, and you think that was from Mayupa? That order came up from high? Well, it definitely uh -huh. came from Iopa because at that time, uh, Jackie Cerrone stepped up also and stepped up and said, no, I, I, I don't think killing Danny Seifert was the right thing to do. I don't think we should. And, but um, Jackie Cerrone was quick, quickly snuffed. And then once the murder happened and the way it happened, Jackie Cerrone now was kicking back and saying, see, I told you that that shouldn't have happened. We shouldn't have hit Danny Seifert. And now Iopa had to deal with that because it was his call. And it was odd because Cerrone really liked him, but her dad didn't trust Cerrone. Right. So it was odd. But if he did, instead of testifying, instead of if he would have just went away, done his two years and come back, he was actually going to come out and go under Cerrone. So your, your father didn't testify uh, because he was killed, but you mentioned earlier um, the other company, Gaylor, and someone from that company did testify, Harold Lurie. Harold Lurie, yeah. But at this point, he had a little uh, de-incentive. Sure. Yeah, it was a moot <laughs> point, really. The case didn't go anywhere because now at that time, Harold Lurie became the star witness, and Harold Lurie couldn't uphold with Tony Spilatro being right there in the front row as one of the defendants. Uh, Spilatro was just giving him the eyeball of death and Harold Lurie just crept and crumbled on the stand. And that's when the case just diminished. Completely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so those, those guys all got, all the guys that we talked about, they, they, got, they all walked, they yeah. all walked. Which just goes to show the immense power and reach of the Chicago Outfit, which we're gonna continue to explore on episode nine on Inside the Chicago Outfit when we reinvestigate Tony Accardo, join us then. And I want to thank my special guest, Mr. Nick Seifert. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me. And of course, got to say thank you to Lion. See you next week. <laughs>